Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for today's training in partnership with Connecticut Main Street Center. My name is Abby Heinemeyer, and I am the Education Coordinator at CCM. Before we get started today, I'm going to go over a few housekeeping items. First, this webinar is recorded, and a copy of the recording, as well as copies of the presentations, will be distributed to all attendees following the presentation. All attendees will be muted today. However, we want to strongly encourage you to all participate. You can do this by submitting questions. You'll see on the right side of your screen, there's a control panel, and on it, there's a questions tab where you're able to type your questions in for today's presenters. We will have two different segments during today's presentation to address your questions. And again, we strongly encourage you to write in and participate. With that, I'm going to hand it on off to today's first presenter, Patrick McMahon from Connecticut Main Street Center. And thank you to CCM for hosting this uh, webinar. And also thank you to Mike and Marissa for joining us this morning on this important topic. Connecticut Main Street Center is a statewide nonprofit organization working with communities all across the state uh, to promote investment in downtowns and neighborhood commercial districts and to create a sense of place uh, and activity. Our role is to assess, to educate, to convene and to advocate to develop and grow downtowns. We build the capacity of downtowns to be place-based, inclusive, sustainable centers that leverage the marriage between economic development and the preservation and adaptation of the built environment. We're excited by a new strategic partnership between the Connecticut Main Street Center and the Connecticut Conference of Municipalities. The partnership focuses on advocacy, communications and storytelling, and education, for which Connecticut Main Street Center provides educational programs that qualify for the Certified Connecticut Municipal Official Program. At Connecticut Main Street, we espouse a comprehensive approach to downtown revitalization. All of these different topics on this screen combined together make for a more enjoyable, livable, and prosperous downtowns. And as you can see, one of the focus areas is connectivity. It's one of the major components. Focus on multimodal connectivity, transit options, making areas more walkable and uh, bikeable, and the aspect of transit-oriented development to bring on additional economic development. For this morning's session, I'm gonna go through the economic and community impacts of Complete Streets and show some example projects. And then I'm gonna turn it over to Mike and Marissa who are gonna talk about tips for successfully navigating Complete Streets projects across the state. Our main streets at one point, our traditional main streets were multimodal. There was connectivity, street cars, automobiles, plenty of pedestrian friendly activities. But over the years that uh, uh, that changed, suburbanization, the highway system, uh, single zoning uh, districts made it so that that rich tapestry wasn't necessarily always there. But thankfully things are changing back. Complete streets can be utilized in our village centers, our traditional downtown centers and in our urban downtowns. Doesn't matter the size of the community, uh, complete streets, making uh, the areas more walkable, bikeable, and where there's uh, bus transit, making uh, the, the bus uh, transit connectivity uh, more robust uh, is very, very important. Uh, the National Main Street, Main Street America and Project for Public Spaces presented uh, a, a, a uh, document that shows the different benefits of complete streets. And there's an economic value, there's environmental value, uh, reducing the carbon footprint and making it so that our air quality is better, uh, health and uh, the health of uh, the population. Uh, by having walkable streets, uh, we can impact uh, obesity. Uh, we can make it so that there's less uh, pedestrian and uh, bicycle related uh, accidents that result in, 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 in injury. Uh, so the safety is very important and it makes it an area more, more livable. 
essentially, the complete streets allow for that social connectivity. Uh, and through social connectivity, there's better mental health. Uh, so complete streets are, are just incredibly important for uh, our downtowns. There's also an equity component. Uh, folks who are, who are disabled, if you're a young family and you have a, a stroller or you're uh, in uh, wheelchairs, uh, you know, you want to be able to uh, be able to uh, uh, circulate around the, the downtown in an equitable fashion. Sorry, it took a second to uh, move the slide. Uh, the elements of complete streets, you know, here's a couple of photos of an area in New York City. Uh, which would you prefer in your neighborhood, uh, the top image or the bottom image? Uh, obviously, with the bottom image, they've got uh, designated bus lanes. There's uh, much more uh, focus on narrower uh, crossings uh, of, the, of the roadway for pedestrians. You can see uh, bicycle uh, uh, infrastructure, so very, very important to, to move things uh, forward in our, in our cities. Uh, a couple of wonderful uh, organizations that focus on Complete Streets, Smart Growth America and the National Complete Streets Coalition. I highly recommend that you uh, tap in to these uh, various um, uh, sources uh, for information. Uh, the sense of safer streets, stronger ec economies is very, very important. Uh, a study of the economics is, excuse me, there's limited data for the economic return on complete streets. Uh, most information on the economic impacts are anecdotal or very specific to uh, one jurisdiction. Uh, some projects include multiple elements, including streetscaping, uh, new transit stations, and marketing and business uh, development campaigns. So it's difficult to determine what impact the Complete Streets projects had. Uh, in their publication, Safer Streets, Stronger Economies, the study extrapolated data from multiple projects. 37 projects were examined in the study. The economic analysis focused on 22 projects that occurred in commercial areas to assess business impacts, among other metrics. Uh, looking at uh, new, business, uh, new businesses, employment, and earnings. And what the study uh, indicated is that it, uh, collision and industry, uh, injury costs uh, went down, employment levels went up, uh, property values increased, private sector investment increased, and there was a uh, increase in net new businesses. In a study of East Village uh, shoppers in New York City finds non-motorized users accounted for the bulk of retail dollars spent uh, in the study area. As you can see, 95% of retail dollars spent were by non-motorized users. Uh, people on bike and foot spend most per capita per week, uh, 163 and 158 respectively, uh, whereas motorized users just uh, kept on driving through. In a survey of 15 real estate uh, markets from Jacksonville, Florida to Stockton, Mass, uh, California, a one-point increase in the walkability as measured by walkscore.com increased home values by $700 to $3,000. Uh, FYI, uh, walkscore also has bike scores and transit scores that can be viewed at various locations, so check out those resources. Uh, commercial values also benefit from uh, walkable areas. As you can see, an increase in walk scores uh, resulted in commercial values increasing by 5 to 8 uh, percent. The first uh, focus community is uh, Brookfield. Uh, they created a town center, uh, and it was at this, lo excuse me, this location, uh, the intersections of Route 202 and 25, known as the Four Corners. Uh, they began a five-phase project. Uh, the first phase cost $3.5 million uh, near the intersection of the state routes. Uh, the second phase connects Brookfield Town Center to the Still River Greenway and included a 
federal grant for the in the funding mix. Uh, the Connecticut Trail Census found almost 198,000 people used the trail in 2017. So connecting it to the town center was cons uh, considered very important. Another phase of the project was uh, recently approved for $3.6 million utilizing primarily load SIP uh, funding. This uh, artist rendering shows the Brookfield Village development, a $25 million project that when completed will consist of four mixed use buildings, 26,000 square feet of first floor commercial with Uh, for four, uh, 48 affordable housing units. Subway, uh, Rich Farm Ice Cream, and Traveling Chick Boutique have already moved into the Brookfield Village. And the second phase includes 40 market rate apartments and uh, 15,000 square feet of retail. Here's another uh, rendering of the downtown uh, development, and you can see it's uh, complemented uh, by, by the Streetscape project. People in uh, transit-connected locations can save a lot of money on transportation costs. As you can see here, uh, typical household expenditures on transportation are 19%. And if uh, you're located in a place where there are complete streets, uh, the, the costs are closer to 9%. So big, uh, big cost savings by living in a walkable uh, downtown. A second uh, community to highlight here is New Britain, and uh, their uh, Complete Streets projects have uh, paid significant uh, dividends. It's a multi-phase project. Uh, kudos to Mark Moriarty, uh, who heads their Department of Public Works, Mayor Stewart, uh, and others. Uh, New Britain is reaping the economic development rewards of that com multi-phase Complete Streets project. It signaled uh, to the private sector, it was public investments signaling to the private sector uh, that we mean business downtown, uh, please uh, look at our buildings and uh, invest private sector dollars. And that has ha been happening. Uh, the Andrews uh, building developed by Jasco uh, Partners at 132 uh, Main Street is on your left. Uh, it's a beautiful historic building built in 1903. Uh, the top four floors were converted, uh, were, uh, converted from offices uh, to 21 bedroom apartments and the first floor has space uh, for a restaurant uh, bar. Another building uh, a block away from the, uh, uh, from the Andrews is at 222 Main Street, which is five stories and has been transformed into luxury apartments on the upper floors with a restaurant on the first floor. Uh, the $4 million project is part in Part of an effort to revitalize the downtown and it's right on the city's uh, central park a couple of other really important projects in the in the downtown include uh, the opening of uh, 16 apartments over retail at 99 west and the most recent uh, project is uh, the Cortland's arms uh, uh, building converted to affordable housing, very exciting uh, projects with millions of dollars invested in the downtown. Uh, Central Connecticut State University has a presence in downtown uh, and is complemented by the Complete Streets Project. It's an absolutely wonderful walking environment and it's been a game changer to the, to the downtown. Uh, Columbus Commons is a two-phase housing project located in downtown that will yield 160 apartment units upon completion of both phases of construction. In the first phase of the project completed in March 2020, uh, Dakota Partners constructed 80 units along with community facilities and 10,000 square feet of retail on the ground floor. $30 million a, uh, has been invested. Uh, the building's located directly across the street from the Connecticut uh, Fast Track Station. And all of this has been uh, weaved together because of the Complete Streets project. Uh, developer Avner Krohn has bought into uh, New Britain's uh, vision, as you can read here. Another community I'd like to highlight is uh, Windsor Locks. 
uh, reimagining Main Street and transit-oriented development. Winter Locks knocked down most of its historic Main Street during urban renewal and moved its train station out of the downtown core. And the community has regretted that decision ever since. Uh, in 2008, a Main Street master planning study was completed that recommended moving the train station uh, platform back into the downtown. Uh, after some convincing, DOT bought into the vision. We'll be constructing a new station adjust, adjacent to the historic station. The town has already been awarded approximately $6.2 million in LOTSIP funding for its complete streets project. Uh, new mixed-use development with apartments and a public market are on the drawing board. Uh, significant uh, discussions are taking place between the town administration and private uh, sector developers. And obviously the location of the train station uh, is impacting this development, but certainly the prospects of uh, complete streets is adding value to this area. Here's a couple of more renderings of what uh, this area is gonna look like once the public market uh, is established. It's gonna be an exciting new addition to the, to the downtown. Uh, the State Bond Commission has approved uh, $45 million in state borrowing to fund the uh, new downtown Windsor Locks commuter rail station uh, for the Hartford Line. Uh, the approval comes on the heels of some uh, additional federal funding in the tune of $17.4 million. And the Complete Streets Project uh, is going to uh, service this whole station area. The town planner and the rest of the Windsor Locks administration is hoping that the Complete Streets project translates into new business, uh, jobs, and local spending. Uh, when these different projects happen, uh, town officials uh, with the ribbon cuttings, et cetera, these streetscape and Complete Streets projects uh, really signal to not only the private sector developers, but even the residents that uh, the downtown is a special place. Uh, Torrington. Torrington's another uh, community that uh, pursued uh, sidewalk improvements and uh, better crosswalks. Uh, it's a classic downtown that uh, got new life. Uh, it's anchored here by the uh, Warner Theater. Uh, the Nutmeg Ballet is uh, located in the downtown area, some great shops and, and restaurants. Uh, but the, the sidewalks and the uh, street network uh, was were not uh, uh, amenable uh, to a really proper downtown uh, location. So some federal funds were brought into uh, into play uh, that made it so that there were wider sidewalks, uh, attractive uh, 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 decorative lighting, new street trees, uh, et cetera. Obviously, as you can see from this picture, the outside dining, uh, this uh, section of the roadway can be closed down uh, during the course of the year for uh, public uh, events. It really has made a, a big, big impact to the downtown. Uh, the town is working on the redevelopment of the Yankee Peddler uh, Inn, uh, and the streetscape project is certainly a uh, important amenity uh, for that. Mayor Carbone espoused the virtues of the project. Uh, the completed sidewalk project has transformed our main streets. Very exciting. Uh, she mentions that the streetscape project generated renewed interest in the downtown from potential uh, developers. I know that uh, Penrose uh, Development's doing a housing complex. They did the Franklin Square improvements, and a lot of this was generated after the, the streetscape project. It's very exciting. Uh, you'll get higher business occupancy rates if you provide bicycle, pedestrian, and transit uh, facilities, so it behooves communities to, to pursue this. Uh, town should start with a complete streets policy. Uh, New Haven was one of the first to adopt a complete streets approach. West Hartford and Fairfield have been recognized for their plans. Uh, if your community adopts a complete streets plan, be certain to submit it to uh, Smart uh, Growth America for their inventory. Ten communities in Connecticut have been recognized by the League of American Bicyclists as bike-friendly communities. It would be great to see more Connecticut uh, towns seek this uh, designation. 
I know for certain that uh, the town of uh, Simsbury, uh, which is a neighboring community to where I live, certainly highlights the fact that it's a bike friendly community. Uh, another designation is walk friendly communities and, and Hartford was recently uh, recognized as a silver recipient of that designation. Uh, it's been uh, impressive to see how uh, lane closures and streets and parking lots have been uh, converted in our downtowns on a temporary basis to assist uh, uh, restaurants during the pandemic. Uh, the outside dining really added vibrancy to the downtowns. It would be great to see some of these uh, improvements really become uh, permanent. Uh, complete streets and streetscape projects don't uh, happen without significant funding from the state. So those of us who can advocate for funding, like Urban Act, uh, like the Small Town Economic Assistance Program, uh, like community connectivity, uh, we should do so. Uh, in the current legislative session, House Bill 5429 uh, will make dramatic improvements in the state's efforts to create more pedestrian and bike-friendly communities. The bill includes provisions for crosswalk safety, a mechanism to create uh, pedestrian safety zones in downtown, uh, downtowns and community centers. I think that's a really uh, exciting uh, initiative and that was uh, recommended by DOT. So it just shows how uh, far DOT has come from auto-centric uh, uh, policies to more uh, multimodal policies. And what that would do is uh, if a community does a, a traffic analysis and they determine in their downtown they want a section of it to be as low as say 20 miles per hour, uh, they have a mechanism to uh, petition uh, DOT to, to uh, reduce speed to that level. Very exciting. Uh, you also have the ability under this uh, statute, uh, hopefully, hopefully pass statute, uh, to lower uh, vehicle speeds on roads of local jurisdiction. So that would be up to, uh, to you as a community to determine to go forward that, to, with that. Uh, if you're not a member of Bike Walk Connecticut, I would encourage your participation. Uh, they are constantly advocating at the state capitol uh, for pedestrian and bike uh, friendly measures. Uh, I'd also point out uh, sustainable CT. Uh, if you are a registered community and you're looking for certification, uh, you can get points by uh, furthering complete streets in, in your community. I'm going to leave you with a few statistics that show that if you want your community to attract uh, new residents, then uh, complete streets certainly make a big difference. 12% uh, of millennials prefer walking over driving. Uh, I'm sure some of you know uh, people like my son, who's uh, just completed his freshman year at Boston University, who does not have a driver's license. Uh, he just expects to live in a downtown walkable area, and uh, he's not alone. It's becoming uh, more commonplace. So to attract young talent, uh, having those walkable, bikeable downtowns is really critically important. Uh, having sidewalks and places to walk is a significant factor in people's decision to buy a home. As you can see here, 75% of folks believe that that is an important criteria. Uh, homeowners are also willing to pay a premium for homes in downtown friendly communities. Absolutely, look at, look at that uh, premium. Uh, if you're in a walkable uh, community. So you as a, as a community, if you can get it downtown that is connected, uh, you're gonna boost your bottom line. And with that, uh, any questions at this point? All right, uh, I don't see any questions popping up into the uh, questions box. So I will pass this over now to Marissa. And Patrick, we probably should mention, um, you know, if any questions come up as we're talking about your presentation, feel free to throw them into the chat and um, we can address them either in that way or we can get to them at the end, right? Sounds great. All right. So um, thanks, right. Patrick. Thanks, Marissa, for uh, putting the presentation up. 
Um, so, and thank you to CCM for um, for inviting us here and allowing us to kind of share our story and our presentation today. Um, so I'm gonna get this thing started. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Mike Chirpak. I'm a project manager at Connecticut DOT's Highway Design Office. Uh, with me today is Marissa Baffinger, who heads up the CTDOT's um, Highway Management Unit. And um, so we worked with Patrick on the development of the Complete Streets Forum that we hosted um, alongside UConn's T2, T2 Center um, that was back in October. So I don't know if anyone um, on this call was able to, to be at that, um, but it was it was pretty went pretty well, and and we got some. Um, some good remarks about this presentation. So we wanted to be able to share it with you again and maybe from a little bit a different perspective, right? Um, and so what we learned when we developed that was um, there are some minor misunderstandings, even, even internally within DOT, about how projects become projects and how small nuances so between things like such as funding sources and you know the purpose of the job and how it was initiated can either open up or, or close some doors on designers trying to incorporate complete streets elements um, into our projects. And these are projects that are primarily on state roadways, um, but I think the same message kind of applies to, to all types of projects, whether they're municipally, uh, municip municipally led or if they're state led jobs. Um, so we wanted to, to kind of go through, excuse me, go through this again um, with that different perspective. So we'll see if we can go to the next slide. All right, so real quickly, the agenda. Um, really what we want to do is give everybody a better understanding of the structure of DOT because it can get confusing pretty quickly. Um, we want to provide an overview of how we initiate our state projects on our state highways, um, really with the feeling that we're doing a much better job considering complete streets elements of recent. Uh, and we want to kind of share those wins um, with everybody here because we think it's valuable. And lastly, we're just going to kind of leave you with some takeaways, some things that we feel are important that each municipality can or should be doing to ensure that Complete Streets elements are getting into projects within their communities um, so that, you know, we, we can keep pushing these, these efforts forward and, and, and providing projects that fit well um, within that community. Go ahead, Mark. So just a little bit about myself. Um, thanks to Marissa for, for making me an, an avatar. She did it with herself on the previous presentation, but now I'm one. Um, so a little bit about me. So again, my name is Mike Chirpak. I have 14 years of experience in the State Highway Design Office. Um, in that time, I've been working on uh, and implementing um, a number of different in-house design roadway projects. And so, you know, I could be working on one day a, a multi-use trail. Um, the next day I could be doing a retaining wall replacement or rehab. Um, alongside a roadway, uh, intersection improvements, looking at safety improvements, capacity improvements, all the way up to um, doing major freeway corridor improvements. A lot of my time personally has been spent in and around the Merritt Parkway, um, upgrading its corridor, its bridges, working on its landscape, um, working with the stakeholders down there. Um, and I've been serving on the Complete Streets Committee from a highway perspective for the last about two years. And like I mentioned earlier, you know, was part of the leading the DOT-led um, presentations for that Complete Streets Forum held in the past October. So really my goal today um, is more to give the perspective of a designer. So when I'm working with the towns on a project that we got from maybe Marissa's unit that's been scoped, it comes to me, my perspective as to working with the towns um, and, and the town staff on what we can and can't do as part of these jobs. So that's kind of for me. All right, hi folks, uh, my name is Marissa Paffinger. Um, so I also have just about 14 years of experience with the DOT, uh, but my experience has been a little bit more, more broad. Uh, when I first joined, I actually started with the Division of Traffic Engineering, um, starting in, in traffic uh, right out of school. Um, and traffic engineering is the group um, for a lot of the municipal folks on the call that, that probably most closely works with municipalities on day-to-day -day issues. Lots of contact with the local traffic authorities, the LTAs, um, solving a lot of of, and, and investigating a lot of um, resident-led complaints and having a lot of back and forth there. Uh, after working in traffic engineering, I did move to the state highway unit um, where Mike has, has spent his career. Um, I was both a designer and a project engineer at that level, so I was overseeing a small group of engineers as we, um, you know, 
completed the design phase for some of those different projects. Um, I've worked on uh, shared use path projects, uh, work on the Merritt Parkway as well, um, culvert replacements, retaining walls, and roadway improvements itself. Um, most recently though, and in my current role, I do lead the department's highway management unit. Um, that's a unit that's actually gone by a number of different names over the years. It's been the project concepts unit, it's been the project development unit, currently known as the highway management unit. But our major role and responsibility is to scope and initiate projects. So we're the group that takes it from gee, um, you know, there's something wrong at this location, you know, what can we do? Uh, we're the group that really dives in and tries to figure out the solution for a project and assign a cost and relative scope for it um, and get it into the design process where we would then hand it off to folks like Mike and his, his team. Um, so, so that's really me in a nutshell. Um, and from here, we're just gonna move on and talk a little bit about the department organization. Yep, thanks, Marissa. So, <clears throat> Connecticut DOT, there's five main bureaus that are within Connecticut DOT, and, and I'm not gonna go through them all, don't, don't, don't worry. Um, we're kinda gonna focus on, on, on who you should be talking to, right? There's a number of different groups here. You could be talking to us, we live in engineering construction, right? So um, we're, we're in highway design, that's where, that's where we live, but you probably are talking to traffic engineering quite a bit, um, you're probably talking to people in policy and planning quite a bit. Community Connectivity Grant stuff is housed in the policy and planning um, office. And so we want to make sure that, you know, you're, you're talking to the right people. And one of the messages that we want to provide today is, is you know, we suggest relying on RPOs as the majority of the communication um, between the department and the towns. Um, but we realize that's not always the case, right? So the hard part, Finding the right person might be hard to track down. So we kind of want to just give an overview that we have projects initiated in, in from these different units. Um, Marissa, do you want to add to that? Yeah, I think um, I think really just the the real purpose of this is is to help uh, the the folks on the call really understand just how many different areas um, of of expertise there are within the department. Um, you know, even within the Bureau of Engineering and Construction itself, um, on the engineering side, you know, our our bridge engineers are very very detailed and focused on bridge replacement projects and have a level of expertise there. But that doesn't mean that our projects don't include highway design projects don't include some level of bridges. Same with traffic. Um, you know, the Division of Traffic Engineering, as I noted, has uh, a lot of communication with, with the public, with the towns, with the LTAs, um, and that's a somewhat different expertise than, than what the actual role in highway design is. So, so overall, um, you know, I guess the, the real intention here is just to explain how many different areas you could find yourself in, and that if you do have a highway focused project or a roadway focused project, understanding that somewhere in engineering and likely within highway design is the best place that you wanna end up. Um, and generally most folks around the building are very supportive of trying to put you in contact with the right person, uh, but sometimes it does take two or three tries. Um, so, but once you find the right spot, that's, um, that's really the goal of just sort of demonstrating the different areas of expertise. Absolutely. All right. So um, again, just to sort of drill down a little bit more, even within the division of highway design, um, there are actually three different subgroups. So again, talking about just the different layers here. Uh, so as we talked, uh, Mike has, um, Mike's focus in career has been in the state highway design unit, and that really focuses on the capital improvement projects that he was discussing before. Whereas my group, the highway management unit, um, our chief purpose is to, to identify potential projects, uh, to scope those in, those uh, potential improvements, and then to actually put them into our capital plan via our initiation process. Um, so even though, again, we are under the same division and heading, do have different roles and responsibilities and different staff that support those two different efforts. And Marissa, it's important to note that these projects are ones that are usually, almost always, on state roads, right? Yep, that's a that's a great point. Yep. So um, the bulk of our our work, the bulk of um, you know the division of highway design, generally falls to improvements on state roads. Um, we do have a local roads group that is represented in our consultant design section. Um, they're the group that uh, initiates the and oversees the the lots of program as well as um, the TA program, some of the other smaller. Uh, different funding source programs, um, but ultimately most of the projects that that come through the division of highway design are on state routes. Yep. yep. So what I kind of want to mention here is that while our while our projects are primarily focused on the roadway, um, they're they're not blind to whatever else is going on. Sometimes the bridge jobs kind of can be, or the 
traffic signal jobs can, but ours are more focused on the whole entire corridor. And so that's why it makes our kind of understanding of the community and its needs for complete streets on our state roadway is so important because we, we may have the opportunity to implement as many complete streets things as we can into our roadway projects because we're, we're no longer looking at the vehicle centric um, model, right? We're looking at vehicles, pedestrians, bus, bikes, you know, maybe something else in the future, who knows? Um, you know, those kinds of things, we're trying to kind of incorporate everything into, into our package um, to put it out, while also upgrading bridges and traffic signals within our project limits. For instance, we may have a, um, a bridge that uh, is, is up for repair soon. We're gonna, we're gonna consider, all right, do we need to widen that bridge out for a bike lane, or do we need to widen that bridge out for a water shoulder? Um, while we're going through the scoping process of that particular project. And that wasn't always the case, right? That wasn't always the case, you know, in years past. And so we're starting to get to a point where we're doing a better job scoping our jobs earlier. And that's kind of one of the main focuses of today. Mm -hmm. All right, so we're gonna kick things off on the, the content here and start a little bit broad. Um, so one of the questions that I very often get asked is, is quite literally, how do projects become projects? How does it go from an idea to actually getting into our capital plan, having funding dedicated to it, and really going through that design phase and heading towards construction? Um, so this whole section is really just aimed at sort of a high level overview of the steps that we take in my unit in order to have a project become a project. Um, so to start off with, uh, you know, really the first step is being notified of a potential issue, um, and that can start from any number of places. That can be an existing DOT plan or information that we have on record. That could be a corridor study or a data-driven analysis um, that's, that's happened around the state. Um, and then obviously we also have input from those outside the DOT. So from councils of governments or RPOs, um, sometimes there are legislative requests, and then obviously town requests too. Uh, the folks that know the streets the best that they drive on are our municipalities, um, and we do often receive requests for improvement from, from uh, local sources. So once we've once we've been made aware of a potential problem, the next step is really information gathering. Um, and this has really taken on a new life over the past uh, handful of years as different data sets have become available and as our availability for, for really utilizing um, you know, cross bureau information has gotten better. Um, so we generally start by, by looking at the crash history for the area um, using the Yukon Crash Repository. We collect whatever traffic counts are available um, and congestion data too. And traffic counts can very often include both uh, motorized vehicles, uh, pedestrian and bikes. So that um, that's actually a pretty big change over the last handful of years. We're having comprehensive traffic counts that include not just our motorized traffic has become a lot easier to obtain and we're doing that earlier in the process. Uh, we also utilize uh, either survey information or LIDAR data to help us understand what the existing ground looks like. If there's, um, you know, a steep hill or a sharp embankment um, that would come into play as we would look at the area surrounding uh, the potential location. Um, we utilize GIS information or any other available to, to try to understand where property lines are, uh, what the state owns versus what it doesn't. Um, and that's really just lining up uh, the, the potential footprint of, of where an, impro uh, an improvement right might be. Um, we coordinate within our other bureaus, looking at our other state partners for the, the information that they might have or resources that they might have. And then we do try to do our research as well. Um, and that includes generally a field visit to the area, but also uh, reaching out and, and looking at different town or regional plans or information that might be available online. Um, and really the goal here is, is to try to define what the deficiencies uh, of the area might be and clarify what the intent of an improvement might be. Um, most, uh, as we noted, most of the, the types of projects, their potential projects that come to us do have a foc focus on uh, congestion or crash or are or, or condition based. Um, but ultimately, um, you know, we do recognize that um, that all the information needs to be gathered before we can start to even you know identify what that what the potential problem is and we're really looking to validate the concern if someone comes and says hey i really think that you know there needs to be a traffic signal at this location we can't you know decide one way or the other what the right solution might be until we uh, have an understanding of what all of the information that's that's available presents for that spot 
Um, from there, the third step is to actually develop the alternatives. Um, and we can do this with a number of different resources. Um, you know, the first step is really depending on what the perceived problem might be to identify any best practices or data-driven solutions that might be available already that we know of as a, as a proven countermeasure. Um, we can also simulate and model the existing and future conditions with a number of different software programs to allow us to quantify. Uh, so for example, again, using just a standard traffic signal as an example, um, if we know that there's a lot of peak hour congestion, if during the commuting hours there's long queues, we can model that existing condition and then uh, by proposing certain changes, we can understand that the difference between what the existing condition is and what the proposed improvement would actually provide. Um, we do a lot of internal coordination within the DOT, uh, specifically with our Bureau of Policy and Planning. Um, we have a bicycle and pedestrian needs travel assessment form um, that is really sort of the foundation for uh, doing that early involvement and looking at what the bicycle and pedestrian needs within the project area are, um, real, uh, relying on our um, on the experts within our bureau and policy planning to highlight things that maybe we didn't pick up on our own to understand where there's bike networks to understand where there's planned improvements uh, on the bike facilities um, to understand where maybe there's a gap in pedestrian uh, connectivity sidewalk gap what have you um, that should really be looked at and incorporated um, we also rely on our rights of way for for similar information and a big part of what we do uh, depending on the actual scope of the job is to conduct um, outreach so that's both with the the town uh, municipalities the, the leaders themselves, and then also with stakeholders. Um, and that's really in, intended to gauge public support for the type of improvement that we're looking at, making sure that we're being consistent with, with the area. Um, part of our role is to develop cost estimates uh, because ultimately uh, we are working within restricted funding environments. And so understanding what the improvement costs uh, helps determine the level of feasibility it is within the overall program. And then we vet and review that with our internal staff uh, before getting final sign off. And, and really the goal of this whole phase, the goal of the whole scoping phase is to define that preferred alternative, define the, the alternative that uh, is the best fit for, for the perceived problem at this location. Uh, from there, the, the actual project initiation step is the last is the last uh, aspect of this. So we prepare we prepare a final scoping report, um, and really that's just the the culmination and documentation of all of the work that we've done to date. So what is the information that we gathered? Where did it come from? What were the different alternatives that were considered? Why did we uh, select the preferred alternative that we did? Um, and really the goal here is to just help with decision making in the future. Um, just to, to coordinate and document all of the different information that went into the justification for this particular project. Um, when we send up our final approval form, we do have to include that the estimated costs uh, and approximate time schedule. Um, and then also we identify a critical location information that's, cr that's uh, important for different funding opportunities. Um, and that comes into play once the proposed project moves to our Bureau of Finance and Administration. Um, funding is very challenging. Uh, within the state environment. Uh, there are a number of different buckets. I think we have close to 55 different federal funding buckets. I think there's about 15 different state funding buckets. Um, and every single one of those buckets is a different size. It has different eligibility criteria. Um, you know, there's different elements that come into play for what that funding can be used for. And so making sure that we have clearly identified the type of project, um, what it's planning to accomplish, and what the overall goal of it is, helps to align the different funding with the, um, with the right type of project so that we can maximize our funding. Uh, and then once that funding is available, which does uh, have a delay just for the request um, and getting it available, that's when the design phase begins. Um, so ultimately, the real takeaway here is to note that all of the different things that we were talking about are happening in that first phase, that conceptual development phase, and that the timing for that can vary depending on the, the complexity of, of the scope. Um, so for a, a more simple project, say maybe a culvert replacement, it's a condition-based project, we should be able to move that through our process fairly quickly. But if it is something more complex where we're uh, evaluating different alternatives for an intersection or there's a corridor with a lot of different components in play, there is certainly a time uh, that, that is associated with getting to that preferred alternative and having that, that um, concept really go through its paces in order to get to that, uh, the point where funding has been allocated. Um, and really that, that's, that's, all of that happens here. And then uh, the, once the project is initiated, it does move to Mike for his design phase. Um, and I'll yep. let you speak a little bit about yeah. that. <clears throat> yeah, so, um, so really, 
I would say for a complete streets project or complete streets elements to to really have the most success to be um, implemented in the real world is that they're included and talked about in that concept development phase. Um, because if they're not, I might be looking at a purpose and need, and we'll get into that in a little bit, that doesn't include uh, the, the need for bike lanes on a particular stretch of roadway. And so it's going to be very, very difficult for me when I'm in that design phase, working with the town, responding to you guys saying, you know, listen, I, I'm going to have to spend another couple million dollars to move these utility lines. And we'll get into this a little bit further, but if you're talking to me in the design phase about a scope change, this, the likelihood of that getting in is is, is going to depend on, um, you know, a management level decision if you want to add that work in. And, and that's going to cost some time. Mm -hmm. Yep. All right. So... As we do move on, I do want to be cognizant of the time. Um, I'm probably going to talk a little quickly, so I will apologize for that, just uh, seeing where we are on the clock, but that I do believe that the whole presentation will be available after the fact, um, and we'll try to hit the high notes if we do need to, to cut down a little bit. Um, so now our second phase is, you know, now that we've talked about the general process, the question really is how, how do we, um, how can we ensure a better complete streets approach? Um, and so for us, uh, on, on the state side, um, you know, we've talked about inf information gathering and developing alternatives, and we talked about getting to that point where, uh, where you've identified your preferred alternative. Well, how do we do that? Um, so uh, really, the, the goal comes down to, um, you know, our decision makers require justification to support the expenditure of taxpayer money and the environmental impacts that are involved with that. And then Texas DOT has another good quote that, you know, taking into consideration various data, input, experiences, alternatives that are discussed internally and publicly, the ones that meet the best meet the project goal is selected. So what does that mean? In our world, project goals and their justification are defined as a purpose in need. Um, you'll hear it referred to a purpose in need statement, but ultimately the purpose in need. So what is a purpose in need? It's fairly straightforward, but ultimately the purpose can be defined as the reason to construct the project. And the need can be defined as the identification of deficiencies of the project supported by the facts. So an example of a need might be, you know, this project is needed because the capacity of the intersection uh, is inadequate to meet future traffic volumes resulting in congestion, reduced mobility, and level of service D. Um, so really just documenting the, the actual data need for why a project might need to come about. Um, and what's important to note, particularly for complete streets discussions, is that a project can include both primary and secondary um, goals. Um, and why that matters is that if a project is, um, you know, comes to our attention for a capacity issue, for a crash problem, um, during the scoping phase and the development of the purpose and need, it is appropriate, um, you know, under certain conditions to have a secondary goals and needs and to have a complete streets focus be included in that purpose and need statement. And that gets it. That gets uh, that adds a level of certainty and and focus for the project, and helps to make make sure that those complete streets aspects uh, withstand the life of the project development process. Yeah. So purpose and need, right? Um, I am often asking my guys, does this particular change in scope going to fit within the purpose and need of the job? Right? Is this is this, is this ask going to fit? And so say, for instance, I'm designing a job that's specifically adding left turn lanes at an intersection. That's the focus of the work. Um, I might have some minor widening and some rights of acquisitions. Maybe I'm doing some new sidewalk it's being installed with curb ramps. Um, but then maybe someone from the public or someone from the town might say, hey, this would be a perfect spot for a, for a bus stop. Um, and most times they're probably right, right? They live in the community, they know it better than I do. Um, so what happens is, I need to make a decision as a project manager. Does adding this bus stop fit within the original purpose and need of the job? And if it does, great. I can probably add it. Um, hopefully it fits. Hopefully I don't have to go and buy it anymore right away or, or much more to, to get it in. But if not, I, I had to rescope the project, right? I have to make the decision. Do I want to go back on my work that I've already done and add more time to the job, get manager approval, maybe even perform an environmental review? maybe go back to the public for more comments. And really all, I, I, I'm losing a lot of time. And unfortunately what happens a lot of times is if that purpose and need was not well-defined with that bus or that pedestrian thing that it needed to have in it, maybe that secondary thing we're just talking about, that good idea 
probably won't happen because we're under pressure to get these projects out, hold schedules and stuff. And going back because we didn't do a great job planning in the first place is something that management at this point in time is not really that that, that favorable to do. Um, so, you know, just to kind of put that out there, I think the purpose need is, is super important. Yep. So we do have two examples of purpose and need, but I'm going to recommend, Mike, that we skip the second one and just talk about this. All right, so um, so as an example of why purpose and need can be important, we can look at an actual intersection in Connecticut. This is Bishop's Corner in West Hartford. Um, and at first glance, it might actually seem like the pedestrian needs are, are relatively accommodated. There's a consistent sidewalk network. Uh, there's pedestrian refuge islands uh, that you can cross to to make the crossing more simple. Um, and there's push buttons on all those islands. But when we look a little bit closer, we can actually see that there are some uh, some deficiencies that might not present themselves right away. Uh, so those short crossings are actually uncontrolled, which means that there's no button to press, to press and a pedestrian really needs to judge a gap before moving from the outside of the intersection onto that island. Um, and then once you get there, the islands themselves are actually relatively small um, and there's evidence of trucks uh, overtopping some of the, the smaller corners there. And then because of just how tight the intersection itself is, there's actually not a whole lot of shoulder. So when you're standing on that island, you're literally standing in a sea of pavement being surrounded by high speed aggressive traffic. Um, so the goals for this project, uh, as we were looking at them, was to upgrade the existing traffic signal equipment, was to try to normalize some of the geometric conditions to help everything flow a little bit better, and to increase the pedestrian comfort in the area. So what does that mean for a purpose and need statement? So for this location, um, and it's a little bit wordy, but uh, and you know take it as approximate, but the purpose of this project is to make the intersection more accessible to pedestrians without degrading vehicular operations. It's needed because the highly congested intersection leads to aggressive driver behavior and hinders the walkability of the area. Specifically, the channelized right turn lanes on each approach do not have pedestrian actuations when crossing, and the islands themselves are not geometrically adequate. So while that is a little wordy and does have a number of specific specific details in there, that also very clearly defines for Mike and his team what the ultimate goal of this project is and gives him a clear focus for what can or shouldn't be included in order to, to satisfy the purpose of this project. And this purpose and need statement is part of the justification for this project, so he doesn't need to go back and ask for permission to add things that are consistent with this. Um, and ultimately, that's the goal of a well-defined purpose and need statement, is to make it clear for anyone and everyone that might need to change the project for some reason, what the ultimate purpose of the job is and why we chose to include it in the program. So again, we, we do have another example. Uh, this was a project that was actually constructed in Middletown. We can see the existing configuration versus the, the, final, um, the final configuration that was constructed with shorter uh, crossing distances and a greater attention on pedestrian uh, connectivity there. Um, so part three, uh, finding balance. And this is really a key, uh, key component to, uh, to what Mike and I really wanted to talk about today. Um, so it really is important to note that um, as, as designers for the state agencies, uh, for, for the DOT, um, we do need to do quite the balancing act for just about every project. Um, there can be many, many different types of users and often the needs of those users can conflict. Uh, there can also be many, many types of project goals, and sometimes the, the goals of each of those could conflict. Uh, so, for example, in order to provide uh, additional um, parking, it might require additional space, and that space might have additional um, environmental impacts. So the goal of the scoping process and really the way that it ultimately ends up playing out is that we need to... Um, really do our due diligence and find the balance within a community to right size the project and understand what impacts relate to what needs and what goals. Oh, perfect World Boulevard. Um, so <clears throat> what, a, what a perfect slide, right? Fantastic concept. Um, you know, maybe this is something that Marissa is going to give me back in the past and say, hey, Mike, go build this. Um, Patrick might even live on P Perfect World Boulevard um, or at least want to you know, where we have lots of amenities, right? We have sidewalks, we have utility strips, bike lanes, you know, our, our, our planters in between the medians, parking, everything, right? So this is exactly what every community wants to have for their main street, all the amenities out there. The reality is we, we live out here and there's just so much going on. And so in order to get to Perfect World Boulevard, we've, we've got to impact some stuff 
And so it's finding that balance that Marissa was talking about. We have utilities, we have, you know, a very narrow right of way. We have, um, you know, houses that are extremely close to the right of way line. So any kind of shifting of the roadway is getting closer to those people's front doors. And, and we have to be um, sensitive to, to the needs of the people that live within the roadway too. And so these are the challenges that we face so lots of times with, with complete streets elements without finding that right balance. So we're working within the community to, to figure out you know, where that needs to be. All right, so diving into, you know, we looked at Perfect World Boulevard, let's take a look at Reality Street. So um, this could be any downtown community where there's, uh, you know, some existing businesses, maybe some residential on the other side. And again, you know, the, the balance of uses may, may be pretty okay out here. We've got sidewalks provided on both sides, there's some on-street parking that's available, and there's two lanes of traffic. Um, but as the department comes about and is about to initiate a project and we start looking at this corridor, you know, maybe we're replacing traffic signals on either end of this particular stretch. And we hear from town officials or we recognize uh, from a town's bike plan that there really is a strong bicycle presence out here and that isn't captured in the existing roadway facility. So our challenge is really to, to communicate with the public, to look at different design standards and to understand what tools are in our toolbox to help compromise and make those different, uh, make those different changes um, more reasonable. So it might be that in talking with the business owner on the corner, there is no way, you know, he has no off-street parking. So on-street parking is critical to his business in order to keep it a thriving downtown area. Um, but maybe there's also a lot of pedestrian foot traffic out here and the four feet existing sidewalks just aren't quite wide enough to accommodate how many people are using the area. And then again, coming back to the, the lack of bicycle facilities. Well, maybe one potential solution for that is to, to be able to talk with the property owner and understand that we can maintain some aspect of on-street parking and that that actually provides us with additional room on the roadway to provide one dedicated bike lane and one Shero, a Shero being a shared lane um, for bicycles to be able to travel with uh, with vehicles in that pattern. Um, in this scenario, we're also able to provide slightly wider sidewalks uh, to help accommodate the foot traffic in the area as well. Um, and this is just one, you know, one potential example of, of finding a balance and finding a compromise between the different uses. Does this business owner now have fewer direct spots in front of him? He does, but he now has the ability to, to maybe attract a safer bicycle um, bicycle group that can now access his business as well. And um, so so where I want to come in here is, you know, there's times what, what happened is I'll go to a public informational meeting and we will have a number of disappointed people um, complaining about the loss of parking in that particular instance. And so my team is built up with problem solvers. They're going to they're going to try to find you know, other places to maybe provide some of that parking. They're gonna work with the community, they're gonna work with the town to figure out how can we mitigate this so that we can get all users um, better equipped to use this particular area. But sometimes we just can't. Um, and and that's where really Marissa's documentation early on comes in to say, look, at, we looked at everything here and we just can't provide a buffered bike lane. It's just not gonna work. Um, and so I have to I have to have that ability to tell people no in order to continue to move the project forward. But it's really that balance, right? So I can only I can only include so much, and then we have to worry about things like dollars too, right? So these these projects are competing, you know, with each other kind of across the state mm -hmm. as in terms of what's the best value that we're getting um, because we only get so much so much money each year. Yep. I would just add too that um, that the documentation that's done at the scoping level um, is is really critical for helping Mike understand what was already done and actually shorten that amount of time that he needs to reevaluate situations. And it could very well be that there are things that come into play that uh, were not captured in our assumptions or documentation and that he should spend time and should do his due diligence to look into to see if it can incorporate. But ultimately, our goal is to work as seamlessly as possible between our two groups to make sure that that those questions that can arise or that person that might still be disappointed even though the process has worked itself out that we can look back and say you know we did consider it and these are these are the reasons why it wasn't included um. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and skip this one. Um, it's really just looking at balancing different needs um, and ultimately uh, really here the um, 
the real challenge is, is as Mike had said, uh, you know, just trying to incorporate as many as many realities as possible into one project. Um, and I don't know if you have anything additional to say about this one, Mike. Yeah, yep. just, just to say that, you know, we do try to jam in as much as we possibly can into these corridor type projects that we can afford and um, that fit within the community that um, that everybody can be happy with. That's the, some of the reasons these times these projects take so long is we're trying to appease so many different um, groups, whether it's the town and its leadership, um, the public, the maybe a particular stakeholder group um, that we're trying to appease too, because we have that responsibility. And so we're 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 that mediator um, trying to facilitate all the needs of the project um, into one package and, and put it out on the street. Mm -hmm. All right, so as, as we go into this final group here, uh, we're just about done, but I do want to note, it, it we are over time, but for anybody that does need to jump off, the presentation is being recorded and will be made available. So there will be, um, you know, if you do need to jump off, you can still catch this last section in the recap. Um, so really our final takeaways here. Um, so one of the things that, that we've recognized over time, or what are some of the things that municipalities can do to really, to really help help themselves and help us. Um, and the first question that we generally ask is, or you know, that we generally encourage, and Patrick touched on this as well, is, is having your own local plans published and developed. Um, have you defined your complete street goals? Have you put that down in a complete streets plan? Um, are there elements or uses that you don't support? Um, I know I've worked with some rural communities that um, that really don't want to see sidewalks along, along state roads because they recognize that the maintenance concern associated with that is not a right fit for their town and not a right fit for those adjacent property owners. Um, so, so understanding that and having thought through the right areas for the different terms. Um, does your zoning reflect your goals? Um, and most importantly, I think for me is, is that information easily available online? Is your town website updated with your most recent plans? Are those things uh, talked about? Is your planning and zoning minutes documented in a way that we can go back and reference um, and really gather as much information as we can um, and try to educate ourselves about the goals of the town and, and really have a good understanding of where the community wants to go with its complete street goals. Uh, we also question, you know, regional awareness. Uh, do you know what's happening at your borders? Do you have shared initiatives with your neighboring towns that could be more of a comprehensive approach so that your, your improvements don't just stop at your town line? And then what's your involvement with your COG bin? Um, if they do have a plan for complete streets, have you participated or will you in the future if you missed this last round? Um, and what's your relationship in general with them? Um, you know, the COGs and the MPOs are great resources for different information, both on funding, um, you know, project development, a number of different aspects, and really encourage, uh, encourage municipalities to, to have a good relationship with their COGs. Um, and then finally, um, internal continuity. Um, you know, does your LTA know what your town engineer's priorities are? Um, you know, does is are those conversations happening? Is there a consistent front that's being presented within your town? And then I think more importantly too, do your policies bridge your administrations? Um, you know, Mike and I have spent a little bit of time talking about delays in the design process. One of the biggest things that I think both he and I have done as um, as engineers for the state is need to go back when a new administration comes in and explain the decisions that were made and why the project a project is moving in a particular direction. And that's our job. You know, that's that's on us. We 100 percent want to educate new administrations as they come in about the things that the state is doing within their borders. Um, but what can cost time is if the policies that the town has in place are inconsistent with a new administration and there's a change, a pause, a difference of opinion or direction um, that can cause time to either reevaluate options that had previously been eliminated or to even question the direction of the project itself. So having a complete streets um, guide, a sidewalk plan, your, your POCD, having all of those uh, internal documents pointing in the same direction really, really creates the character of, of where the town wants to go and, and allows for um, some of the bridging of those administrations in a way that can move more consistently and more smoothly. All right. And then finally, uh, what are we doing to improve? Um, so, 
You know, our complete streets policy has been in place at the department for a number of years now, but we recognize that it's been a learning curve and that we are still moving the needle um, on, on doing this better. Um, you know, one of the things that we've tried to do is engage in earlier uh, public outreach, um, including presentations like this, where you can actually put some faces with names for, for representatives within the state um, and to understand some of our process a little bit. Um, we've tried to draft better guidance documents. Um, we're specifically drafting, drafting a bicycle and um, facility selection guide uh, that's specific to the state of Connecticut. So it takes national guidance and research and really tries to hone it in on what's right for Connecticut to right size uh, the recommendations there. Um, we've also recently released a number of comprehensive plans, including our pedestrian safety strategy that was just out in January of this year. Um, we're focusing on a more data-driven approach where it's appropriate. Um, and also, again, you know, recognizing the need to balance different um, need to balance different needs and different efforts uh, across the state. Um, and ultimately the goal is to instill an environment in which designs are sensitive to and encompass the needs of all users. And with that, um, I do realize that we're over time, but we can open it up for questions if anybody is still available. Marissa, we did get a question. When you are uh, scoping these uh, projects, do you uh, take into consideration reducing car dependency? or are you just primarily responding to identified safety needs? It's a good question. Um, so uh, I would say I would say it depends. Uh, so so we generally are working within the existing network, um, and that means recognizing if we are on an active bus line or if we are near a fast track station or what the existing transit options might be within the area. But the general focus is not on mode shift. Um, that's a little that's more of a policy level decision, and it's difficult to get it on a project by project basis. So we're certainly cognizant of um, you know again providing those connections to transit if they are available and if that fits within the overall umbrella of the project but it, it is not a a chief um, purpose for many of our many of our projects so marissa covid is throwing a monkey wrench into the oh my traffic gosh yes stuff with, yes. Uh, you know distributions and, and traffic volumes mm -hmm. so we're still trying to sort that at that impact out um it still hasn't you know gotten back to a state of normalcy so right uh, but it's something that's something that we're working with with our traffic projections, um, right? I guess. I... Yeah, just to um, you know, anecdotally, we know that uh, you know that that the volumes on I ninety five in the um, southwest corner of the state um, are pretty much back to pre COVID levels, but that our ridership on Metro North isn't, and so we can almost infer that people are getting into their car instead of taking the train like they used to, and we're seeing that normalize a little bit, but that was a very large trend for most of last year. Yep. Well, no other questions uh, have come in. I uh, want to uh, thank uh, Marissa and Mike uh, for joining us today. I think the couple of the important uh, points is uh, complete streets do provide economic benefits. And number two, uh, I think that uh, you have a partner now in DOT. I think that came out really loud and clear and try to uh, obviously go first to your regional planning uh, organization but as soon as you can uh, get marissa and dot involved in the in the scoping all all the better and so with that i'm going to pass it back uh, to abby thank you thank you everyone thank you um, to our presenters today for sharing your expertise this was a wonderful training and we really appreciate your time um, and thank you to our attendees. Again, everyone will receive a follow-up email that will contain a link to the recording as well as to the materials. Um, Patrick was also kind enough that he provided us with a handout with a bunch of resources that will be included in that email. So make sure to keep an eye out. Uh, that is it for today, and I hope everyone has a wonderful day.